very good afternoon to all of you. And now we're going to get into an interesting mode of discussion, which is the big money, uh, as I like to call it. So, you know, uh, so PE funding actually are your investors who are the big investors. Uh, they are the ones who like to stay with you for a very long time. So their uh, period of once they marry you, uh, they at least with you for five years or perhaps even 10 years or more if required. So uh, that's the beauty of PE funding. And you know, uh, what I have realized in India is that PE funds are perhaps the only funds who look at traditional sector like they would look at tech sector or any new emerging sector in the country. So, uh, so there is always, you know, I think some of the funds that are present here, they would always look at, um, you know, investments in areas like, um, the hospitality, hotels, uh, healthcare, hospitals, school chains, education. So that is the kind of investments that they always seek out for, which are probably large and heavy in nature. And at the same time, uh, you know, there is, uh, they want to maintain that stickiness by putting in a lot of professionalism um, in that organization and therefore help them to grow and really find them their true value. Um, so PE funding any, uh, has been on a big rise in India. In, in fact, I had some numbers here. Uh, so in the last quarter of uh, 2022, it was almost $16.5 billion of PE funding. And I'm not talking about VC funding and other forms of angel funding and everything, but PE funding uh, that was seen over here. And um, so 80% of the total PE funds that are happened uh, in the last few years is actually in the traditional sector. Uh, so that that is really where I think a big play is seen in the mid market organizations in India, which are growing and rapidly growing, uh, given the fact that with some tech uh, installation and adoption in their companies, they've seen a much larger growth. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next 30 minutes um, as to how PE funding plays a big role in organizations and helps them to grow. Um, so let me start with you, uh, Herr Pankaj. Um, you know, as a as a fund, how do you first of all? I mean, it, it would be really nice if you also told a little about Zephyr Peacock as to you know what kind of investments you've been doing in your portfolio and how you uh, evaluate investments. But really, I mean, what are the sectors that are looking most interesting to you given the current times? You know, the India shining story is really big. So, but where is India shining for you? And you know what? Where the which Sun rays are you looking to pull out? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the question. I think uh, firstly, we we invest in three sectors. We invest in food and agri, financial services and uh, infra services. And infra is a, a broad sector for us, wherein we have climate tech, manufacturing, logistics, distribution, supply chain models. So those are primarily three sectors that we invest in. Uh, with each company, we have a stage approach to investing, but with each uh, investy company of ours, we at least want to deploy between 60 to 100 crores, depending on how the company performs. So that's how we operate. Uh, given that we've been uh, tracking India markets for quite some time, so we've been present here for more than a decade now. Uh, historically, we've made very good amounts of money by investing in traditional manufacturing assets. So we had invested in a green buildings manufacturer uh, based out of South India and we were more than happy to list it on uh, the National Stock Exchange uh, in 2017-18. But currently we continue to track uh, manufacturing assets which broadly fits within what we want to do within infra. We recently invested in a battery recycling company and a battery repurposing company. The idea there is to run metallurgical processes and extract precious metals out of battery and we think that that's going to be a big theme continuing into the future. We are very bullish on food manufacturing, whether it is a branded food play or whether it's manufacturing services to other brands within India or abroad. And another key area that we've been tracking actively right, in the traditional space is specialty extraction. Now to give you an example, we, we've been talking about food and agri, we see a lot of investments in food tech, ag tech, etc. But if you fundamentally break down the supply chain, there are so many products from where you can extract fragrances, you can extract uh, byproducts which have medicinal use in international markets. So when you start looking at, let's say, curcumin extraction, what can you do with curcumin extracts and how can you ship those products out to global markets? These are very interesting opportunities. These are highly capital efficient models and uh, we 
believe that there's an opportunity for such kinds of businesses uh, going forward. Sure. Uh, coming to you, Shiba, uh, particularly at uh, Pratithiti Investments, how do you sort of weigh uh, your portfolio in terms of, you know, these are the kind of investments you want to make? So, do you at least make some roadmap in, let's say, the beginning of the year uh, to say that, okay, this, these sectors look interesting? And this is where we plan to go by third quarter. Uh, so just a little background, uh, gra background about Pratiti. Um, this is the family office of the, of the Chris Kupakashan family. So we manage investments and all the holdings um, of the family. And as such, we don't really, uh, the, there's no benefit for us to specialize. We are generalists. We are constantly looking at what are the emerging sectors in the market. Um, so we, do, we are mostly sector agnostic. Uh, we do, like you said, you know, uh, periodically we do look at what are the emerging sectors um, and what are the trends. We try to be on top of things, but our approach has never been to uh, do to go to create a top-down um, strategy and go out and find opportunities. Um, that's that's not how we've operated. We usually work as a more as a co-investment model alongside other investors. Um, so, so our uh, portfolio, in fact, we invest in funds. So our portfolio is almost 50-50 split between fund investments and direct investments. As such, we kind of rely, rely on the funds for some of that sector, the specialization. Um, and we don't really do But having said that, so there's just a little background, but we are we are bullish about a lot of sectors in India because overall as a country, there are, there's just so much to be done. And um, we in Bangalore, we are mostly aware of what's happening in tech, but even in traditional businesses, there's just so many opportunities for entrepreneurs to to capitalize on. There is such a big move towards from you know fragmented to more organized, and there's just a huge uh, and increasing levels of you know discretionary income um, and people awareness of uh, products is increasing in the market. So so people can build solid, well, you know, um, well-governed businesses, you know, practically everything in India is, is our feeling. But uh, we, so we look at it opportunistically, though, whenever we get something, we do a deep dive on, you know, is this an op something we want to invest in. Yeah. Sure. Um, coming to you, uh, Kavesh, uh, you know, how, how are you looking at investments? I know consumer tech has been a very big play for you at uh, Ramji Invest. And um, so, give... Is that momentum still continuing? Uh, I mean, you know, I know there was a humongous sort of, uh, uh, pen there was demand during, uh, for digital commerce businesses during COVID and then post COVID there was that, you know, that demand that could not be fulfilled. So there was a big demand, but do you think this wave will continue? And what kind of future consumer tech or some related businesses that you will look in your portfolio? Sure. Um, let me first start with the, telling a little bit about Premji Invest, and then I'll come to your question. Uh, so Premji Invest uh, is an investment fund that invests for Azim Premji Foundation. Uh, we have about $14 billion of assets under management. Uh, so this uh, corpus is deployed across three primary sectors. One is uh, we invest in US, uh, in public markets and private markets there. Uh, secondly, we invest in public markets here in India. And thirdly, uh, we, we invest in private markets as well. And roughly our capital is almost equally uh, deployed in these three areas. Uh, when it comes to private markets, uh, most of our investments are in three verticals. Uh, the first one being FinTech and FinServices. Uh, secondly, uh, it's consumer and consumer tech. Thirdly, it's industrial manufacturing, uh, some want to be to be healthcare. Um, I uh, personally manage the consumer and consumer tech investments. Uh, coming to your question uh, in terms of uh, consumer tech, I think we s continue to stay extremely bullish about the consumer story in India. When you think about India's uh, GDP per capita, it's crossed the $2,500 mark. We've seen that for most countries where, you know, the GDP per capita has grown uh, beyond this point. You know, they have seen a significant increase in discretionary spending. Of course, you know, there is a, there is a quite a bit of disparity even within the consumers uh, uh, within India. And, you know, there is definitely that India 1, India 2, and India 3. 
uh, India one being uh, you know uh, uh, upper middle class kind of consumers who have the spending power of say anybody uh, across say uh, any emerging countries such as say Mexico, Brazil, uh, even even China. Then there is the India 2 which is about again 300 million aspirant customers they don't have all the affordability uh, right now but you know given the right kind of instruments they do have the aspiration to you know some of the same consumer uh, products uh, which which the India 1 can afford today. And then there's of course the India 3 which is the large number of consumers who uh, are currently who currently don't have that much of discretionary income. Uh, we do think uh, that you know there is significant amount of investments uh, that will go into serving the needs of the India 1 and the India 2 consumer over the next few years uh, and these these will be in the areas of uh, uh, you know uh, food, beauty, personal care, uh, of course travel, hospitality, even consumer health care. So those are some sectors I think we do we do expect that there will be a lot more discretionary uh, spending that will go into those sectors. Um, and uh, you know uh, you know in terms of uh, how this you know spend will sort of emerge or where where this will be spent, it will be uh, in you know brands which are better for you, brands which are uh, you know organic which add uh, you know certain. Um, uh, you know, uh, value to the consumers which they don't get from the traditional brands. Uh, there will be a lot more of services play. Customers are looking for, in, you know, much uh, much higher degree of services today. Quick commerce is growing much much faster than it has ever been. Whereas, you know, there was there's always been this debate. You know, who really needs those 15 minute and 20 minute deliveries? But you know, that is really sort of the you know the demand of the customer today. Uh, we do believe that omni-channel will be a big theme going forward. Customers would like to be able to purchase the brands and the products that they're looking for uh, online as well as offline. Uh, and you know, most companies that will be successful will have to manage both of these channels in a more in integrated and in an omni-channel way versus looking at these separately. So uh, I think with that. Uh, just to summarize, you know, we continue to be quite bullish on consumer and consumer tech, and we'll continue to look for investments. Absolutely, that's that's great to know, and you know, great for everybody out here also uh, who's listening to us. Um, uh, Rupesh, I'm going to come to you. So, you lead the Silicon Valley Bank here in India, and you know, as a bank, what kind of investments uh, do you sort of weigh in India? I know, so you you have a global presence, and so. I mean, on an apple to apple comparison between India and the US, what investments do you like here? Uh, well, that would, wouldn't be apple to apple comparison though. <laughs> no, but I think uh, just for the audience, right? I think PE investments in general uh, is a really good part of sort of the spectrum, right? So when a founder starts at an early, early stage, right? Friends and family, some angel investment, then we see and then PE, right? So that is really the spectrum. And last few years, I think PE has been more active in the country, uh, primarily because a lot of the firms, a lot of the startups which have started last three, four, five years have now maturing, right? So there is a need for capital infusion, right? And that is why some of the sectors that you spoke about earlier also, right? Whether infra, which has a lot of capital infusion needs, uh, whether it's ESG, we were talking about this earlier. There's, of course, that omni-channel or digital, right? Whatever you, you call it, right? So I think those are really the sectors which are right for PE funding. And I see this globally. Of course, in India, there's still not a very clear demarcation between VCs and PEs in terms of where they invest and how they invest or even the timeline uh, to invest and exit. Uh, but that is that is that's very normal for a for a market which is still developing. Uh, over a period of time, you would see P's more focused on say growth or late stage companies and on really big ticket sizes than number of deals, for example. But I think for founders at this stage, uh, specifically when I look at India, this is a really good time because it really fills the spectrum beautifully. In the US, particularly, PE firms would typically focus on 
late stage companies an exit of three to five years. You know, they would really have a smaller horizon in place. In general, of course, there are exceptions and nuances and depending on the industry. But that is usually the trend that I have seen uh, in the US uh, with respect to PE investments. And what, what investments do you particularly see in India that have a great trajectory? So, uh, so one is traditional uh, for PE funds specifically, one is the traditional set of business. I have rarely seen PEs getting super excited about pure play tech uh, companies and tech investments. There are again a few exceptions but generally you know they would look at traditional or they would look at an, a digital or a, or an omni channel sort of space. ESG, is, ESG and AI are probably the two newest buzzwords across the globe and India isn't an exception. So that is, is, is again very ripe in all the conversations which is happening at this stage. So I'm, I'm sort of now going to open this to panel discussion. So, you know, anybody of you can take a comment. So, you know, uh, Rupesh just touched upon ESG and numbers say that one out of every five dollars is actually going behind ESG for PE funds. So, you know, now when I look at ESG, it's such a huge broad spectrum from electric vehicles to infrastructure to it just goes on and on if you look at it. So where exactly do you feel the big market is going to be? Is it going to be the new energy market, you know, your EV market or green hydrogen or um, every other sort of market that energy forms that we are talking about? Or is it still going to be the more traditional energies like, you know, I, I don't even know if coal is probably something of interest anymore because, you know, we'll let me come in and I'll give a very brief I, from one of the stuff that I've seen apart from, of course, the new energy is on the agriculture side whether it is about, say, extraction of uh, heavy metals from soil to increase the agricultural productivity, right? I mean, those are, those are very specific instances, but I see a lot of those uh, interest areas pretty much across the globe. Uh, and yes, ESG is very wide, but I think if we remove the energy part, I think that is agriculture is the other piece that I'm seeing quite, uh, quite an interest in. I think, uh, I'll just take two minutes, I think uh, broadly we can pick, fit various uh, impact investments and climate tech investments into the ESG bucket. Uh, within ESG, while climate tech on its own should emerge as an asset class, I think socially responsible investing which has been supporting financial inclusion for, for a very long period of time in India will continue to exist and that would be another theme that will continue to play out through various models which would be tech driven or digital and they'll go beyond traditional loans. So we'll identify new ways to cater to let's say tier two, tier three and rural demand for financial services. And that's another area that would broadly fit within the ESG bucket which will continue to grow. Uh, touching upon uh, the agri side of things, agri, within agri I think there'll be a lot of push on soil nourishment and water management uh, across the country uh, for a range of reasons. One, because soils, if you start tracking decade by decade what has happened to uh, the Indian soil, it is now depleted of so many micronutrients that are very essential to grow crops at a high yield, high productivity rate. And that would fit within what we do as well because there are traditional manufacturers of agrochem, biochem, uh, bio-based materials that would be required for uh, re for nourishment of the soil, right? And we will see new models come up for water-based, uh, better water management for crop cultivation uh, in India. Just, just one, one point I'd like to make is that uh, well, so far people have been tracking ESD and you know giving these numbers because it's been almost like a push mandate. Um, more from, you know, uh, like say LPs demand it, government demands it and uh, other, uh, say, lobbyists, maybe somebody is demanding it. But I think increasingly this is going to be an essential market requirement. I don't think uh, we will need to track ESG also because every business will have to be ESG compliant. You know, I mean, everybody will have to, uh, you can't, you, I don't think you can build a, a large company 
which is actively bad for the environment or actively bad for you know society or has poor governance and um, and these are things which i think are becoming more and more inbuilt into the business models itself um, so we, we currently don't really have a mandate for esg but it's almost like a hygiene factor for us if we see if we see a business model which is not following basic ESG principles, we wouldn't even consider it. So it's not like we are looking for ESG compliant businesses. We just expect everyone to be compliant. So just just wanted to <laughs> make that thing. So uh, hopefully we should be getting to 100% ESG in, in uh, a few years. Yeah. But within ESG and uh, you know, more sort of tangible ways, what do you see as a great investment? I think uh, you touched upon mobility. I think EV mobility is here to stay, uh, right? In fact, there's a secular trend away from um, the ICV vehicles to the EV vehicles. And that is going to, it started gradually, it'll, you know, happen much more suddenly over the years. Um, I think the challenge there is to identify where the profit pools are. Uh, is it in battery tech? Is it in battery swapping? Is it in uh, you know full stack uh, players that you know take care of not just the battery but also the mobility itself? Uh, is it a different business model? Uh, is it two wheelers? Is it four wheelers? So there are you know a lot of different sort of uh, connotations there, and you have to identify where the profit pools are and invest accordingly. Sure. Um, you know, I also want to now pick up on the topic of exit. So, uh, you know, in VC, probably we all the time talk about how important exits are, but probably in PE, because you have more patient capital, you don't look at immediate exits. But when exits happen, and now also given the fact that the stock market is probably been, it's in an unparalleled situation right now, we've never seen this kind of boom in the stock market ever. So. Do you think it's a great time for PE to make their exits and probably look at more greenfield investments, um, you know, fresh greenfield investments going forward? Well, I can take that. So, absolutely, I think this is a great time. Um, but, you know, just, just for everybody's, you know, uh, knowledge, like the way it works is, you know, uh, we do have a certain cycle that we underwrite. You know, we do look at when we make an investment, go for five years, seven years sort of cycle that we underwrite. Uh, so uh, it's not like, you know, because the stock market is good, we will take certain opportunistic calls. However, whatever investments are already mature uh, and are ready for exit and harvesting, uh, you know, I think this is a great time for sure, given how the stock markets are playing out. I think uh, one, funds of course have this requirement because fund structure or fund life is more or less defined 8 plus 1 plus 1 or 10 plus 1 plus 1. Timing and exit uh, is, uh, you can't time the market. So you have to be prepared for whatever asset you've underwritten. How do you exit the asset? In, in our case, we do track industry cycles, we do track market cycles, but we've realized in the past that there could be events like COVID which could disrupt uh, a lot of your exit plans. Uh, the way we work with our companies is we ideally keep uh, engaging with the management to keep them ready for any form of exit that may come our way, whether it is IPOs or whether it is, let's say, late stage mergers. And in select cases, because we've been lucky to invest in some assets that have expanded globally, we are also trying to identify if there are more viable markets for exits. So, for example, one of the logistics companies, this is a, gl a global freight forwarder. We believe that there's a better listing uh, opportunity in Australia, let's say compared uh, compared to India, just because the price premium that Australian logistics companies are commanding is significantly higher. And because we have presence in those markets, we are also portfolio planning and planning our exits from certain such assets from other markets. We have another uh, global uh, lender where we are working to see if we can exit via listing on an exchange in the US because fintech products which are digital in nature are priced better in those markets compared to what has been happening in India over the last couple of years given the regulatory overhang that now exists on the sector. Um, you know, having said that, are also buyouts and acquisitions um, something that are looking interesting at this point of time? Maybe with the 
with an overall connection to the stock exchange? Uh, maybe I'll come in just to your previous question, Ritu. Uh, and I, I think I shudder to think if PE firms or even VCs would like to time the market. I think that's what makes institutional investors quite different from retail ones because they don't want to sort of react to a market situation uh, unless it is really bad, right? Bad is a different situation. They, they might delay it. That is, is, I think, my general answer to it. I don't think any of the firms would really look at a market being high and therefore sort of react to it. I think uh, that probably would be a would be a, a, a not a good move. Uh, generally, is is what I would say to your previous comment. Um, on on the uh, so on this point about uh, M A's and uh, overall buyouts and in fact uh, markets outside India also are not not really that great right now. <laughs> it's the India public markets which are doing really well. So I P O ready companies. This is a great time of course for them to think. Uh, to, to look at IPOs, but other than that, I think M&As are happening um, uh, and there is secondaries are happening, but a lot lesser at a slower pace than we saw a couple of years back. So that hasn't really picked up to, I guess, I would say normal levels from what I'm seeing, uh, but fingers crossed that that will, uh, with that it, in the next later half of the year, Hopefully, things will start moving again because it's been kind of a lull for a few for some time now. Uh, so, talking about buyouts, I think the important thing to understand there is: uh, are there companies where you know there is value, uh, which is sort of not being recognized today because either they are part of a much larger conglomerate, and you know, uh, uh, you know, they are not valued as such. So, is there an option to? you know, take out certain companies from a larger conglomerate where it's not a focus for them or they're looking for, um, you know, cash because, you know, certain other parts of their businesses require it. So there are always such opportunities, right? Uh, I think you just have to look hard uh, and you'll find those. There are also uh, companies which are family run. Uh, and these family run companies in many cases, uh, you know, may have a situation where they're looking for a professional management for multiple reasons, either uh, because that the company has expanded uh, far too much and they, they cannot handle it, or uh, there is a generational change. The next generation is not quite ready to take on uh, the, the operational complexities. So um, we do come across those kind of situations uh, on a pretty regular basis and we continue to be excited about those uh, because I think there is a lot of value that you can unlock by uh, adding like a professional management to run those traditional companies after a buyout. So, so I'll just add, I think uh, while we don't track a few sectors such as pharma and let's say uh, software services or software testing, etc. There are late stage buyout funds or control oriented funds who are evaluating and some of these are listed businesses which have not been run well and they are available for a bargain. So I think at least from an outside in perspective, I'm seeing those kinds of transactions happening. Uh, for, for the sectors that we track, there are many companies who are nearing that IPO stage, but growth seems to be a constraint. So those kinds of companies are now approaching early seed funded companies or VC funded companies to acquire revenue, acquire talent, acquire technology, and even acquire profitability. So we are seeing that pool also open up, but that's not as significant a pool compared to let's say late stage uh, buyouts. Uh, so you know, I, uh, I mean, and I'm not completely sort of up to date on this, but also there is an opportunity today to buy a company that was listed on the stock exchange but probably defunct because of uh, you know its business uh, at the back but again available to make an investment so i mean given that cycle is there is that also a probability for putting a lot of companies in your portfolio on the main stock exchange yeah you know there have been some recent deals by the way where you know, certain companies uh, which were listed, they have been taken up, uh, they are going to go private. I think the uh, opportunity there is, you know, there are certain companies which are subscale, uh, right? And uh, the opportunity that PE funds are seeing is, you know, are there related companies that you can put together and create a platform 
where uh, you know two similar businesses can be joined together bought together get them to a certain scale where both of them start enjoying the synergies uh, so those are some you know things that a pe fund can do very easily versus uh, a company that is organically growing having to do it because you know to acquire a similar size company and merge it on its own it's extremely hard uh, right so uh, so you are you know we 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 see in the uh, market lot of those kind of deals where you know pe funds acquire one two or three companies together merge them and create a much larger company which is uh, at scale and uh, like i said you know where you know in some of the paths is more than the the actual i think ritu just just my, my two cents on this i i don't think i see a lot of that in india at this point in time i don't know if any of you have a differing view to this but i think as we mature both in terms of how we invest in the market uh, and also the maturity of the market overall right so in 7 8 years time i i think you would see a lot of that happening more more regularly and frequently that will make it basically an inorganic way to list right i mean yeah yeah <laughs> uh, i mean i would just have added there are few defunct companies that are available but it's always not easy to integrate with a defunct company because of Uh, i mean it's very difficult to do a diligence on a defunct company for a range of reasons and hence i think uh, at, at least in the financial services space i have realized right uh, that uh, people shy away from doing that at least founders are wary especially if the opportunities are out there right then you'd rather invest there than in distressed assets <laughs> happy to take a couple of questions uh, yeah we have a question from the gentleman can you please pass on the mic to him yeah so uh, just want to take uh, investors perspective here on one particular area now can you be louder can you hear me okay i want to take a investor perspective here uh, especially this question goes to uh, shiva ji pankaj ji and mr kavesh okay so uh, uh, now that you are a traditional funding ecosystem and uh, because you are focusing on the uh, traditional businesses have you ever thought about uh, there are a lot of companies uh, failing because of their sales team not being stronger even after you invest or even if they come to you before investing so have you ever considered that forming a good sales solution company and investing on those such companies like if you affiliate with those companies when they take your investment and if your sales team is approved and you think that sales team can deliver do you think that can enable your investment to come back on time as you expected have you thought about this angle if yes uh, what is your perspective uh, if i pay to sell a sales solution tech <laughs> no no it is just to understand perspective i don't need any investment on sales company that's why i said it's only on the uh, understanding the perspective because uh, uh, there are a lot of sales company who believes being bootstrapped Uh, so it's not for them it's basically for the investor solution what they're looking for is a return and they bank on the company uh, sales team sometimes the sales leaders in that company fail in the market fit and strategy and positioning and approach because of that investors suffer uh, because in getting their money back sure, right we'll so this is a big problem where investors uh, uh, you know wait for a longer period of time for them to come back and they call that as a bad debts so uh, have you ever thought of that in that angle uh, okay so <laughs> if i understood it right you mean uh, the investor builds their own sales team and capability or invests in a separate uh, capability to work across a portfolio is that right yeah let's say uh, for example if you are focusing on uh, verticals let's say uh, industry verticals about 10 verticals 
uh, and if you build a team which can bring in sales for those 10 verticals. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Um, so, so we don't, I mean, and talking about the family office, we don't really get operationally involved. That's not our uh, uh, policy. So, while investing, we try to make sure that they already have the right systems in place because, you know, we won't really be able to support them. That said, some other funds do build such things. Um, mostly, they... Uh, they focus on things like strategy or HR, you know, people to, to hire top uh, level management. Those are the kind of, uh, or even some operational level um, skills. Sales teams, this is kind of, a, I guess it's a little more controversial because from, at least this is my personal experience is that I, I think the company should build their own sales team because it's core, you know, how do you make your money? You can't outsource the revenue making function. Is, is my my feeling. So, I would uh, say that that's a little tricky to do, but I know some funds have attempted that. So, this is something that people do. So, once in a while, I've seen that. Sure. Any, any other, sorry, you want to add something? I think I'll just say that uh, <laughs> as long as I find a company which makes money and has a defensible strategy, why not? We'll evaluate. Uh, but I'll, to give you an example, there have been a lot of investments in the D2C space in India. A lot of D2C in India has grown on the back of e-commerce and own websites. When you compare them to traditional brands which are going into offline retail, and I'm going to give you an example of a company which we invested in, which now supports. Now, whether it's in supporting their sales team, I don't know. But I do know that D2C had that challenge. The company, my portfolio company, solves for a distribution challenge that even FMCG, larger FMCG companies face. So we do evaluate such companies because we believe that there is some defensibility to what they're doing and they can create a very fairly sized very fairly large sized outcome for us so we'll make money there so we've invested in such business models because we see those business models as enablers but not just investing in a sales team because those are capabilities that funds would larger funds would end up build, building it in house sure more questions in the house yes sir uh, can you please pass on quickly the mic to him So, uh, just my question is that as an investor uh, point of view, uh, what is the, your point of view regarding this EV market in India, uh, considering independent of the government policies? So, uh, what's the investor uh, point of view? Shall they are enter into the EV market with independent of the government policies? Because this, as of now, the EV market is more linked to the uh, government initiatives and the policies and all those things. And is a complete a drastic change on the market in the upcoming decades or I can say. So I'll, I'll try. We've made two investments in companies which are linked to EV market. Uh, two points of, I'll just break it down B2B, B2C. Uh, and second is you need, in addition to these two, you need to have a very long term view on EV industry in general. Because first, most likely I believe that there will be many hybrids that will sell before the number of EVs uh, picks up. However, in a B2B use case, because the run of the vehicle right on a daily basis is in excess of 100, 150 kilometers, more and more uh, businesses see merit in, in acquiring, let's say, light commercial vehicles or medium commercial vehicles, right? B2C will take a long time uh, to evolve to that stage. The first step in evolution most likely would be the hybrid strategy. But we continue to remain optimistic about the overall ecosystem independent of government subsidies. Yeah. Yeah. Is EV space overall interesting? I mean, considering the fact that we already have enough and more EV companies out there. So is it sort of still interesting or is it now going to be interesting for PE funds to look at EV investments when companies are growing to that scale and stage? No, I, I think that's what's happening now that the companies are growing to that stage. Now they're entering that the PE stage because, um, and, and again, uh, like Mankaj said, this is more on the B, B2B side, like the, the commercial vehicles because B2C is still, I think a lot of things have to be put into place, you know, the charging infrastructure, the, the grid capability and, and all of that. That's still, so I think that B2C is a little early for private equity. B2B, I think there's some very interesting opportunities coming up for private equity, which have shown some uh, validation already of the business model. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I think this is going to become interesting now for, for private equity. I think uh, 
see when you think of EV, right, the biggest cost is in the battery. Um, and the biggest challenge in this space is battery life, battery uh, range, and so on. So there is a lot of techno technological innovation that can happen to increase the range as well as increase the life of the battery. Uh, and we see startups that are coming in that space who are extremely technical uh, and they are looking to uh, you know, solve these problems. So I think I do see that there will be more investments that will be coming in to uh, you know, support these kind of startups. And I would add battery recycle to that as well, uh, the end of life and all of that bit. But again, I, I think uh, the overall e EV is, is quite ripe for PE because the size of investment and sort of a long-term attitude you need, uh, which VCs typically can't support or yeah. may not want to support. Uh, so therefore, PEs, and I think you referred to about buyouts earlier. So a lot of VCs who may have invested earlier may want to look at for a buyout instead of an IPO. Yeah. And that's where PE firms uh, you know, could really come in and help the sector. Sure. Well, I have been told that our time is up. So <laughs> I'm going to thank you very much uh, to um, you know, Pankaj, to Kavesh, to Rupesh for actually uh, sharing more insights on the PE market. I think given the way uh, you know, the tourism is uh, proliferating in this country, hospitality, hospitals, <laughs> everything, <laughs> you name it, it's all um, you know, looking like a great opportunity to make investment. And education has always been a great sector for India particularly for making those investments so and I feel that you know as we see more and more family offices particularly uh, increasing and all big organizations putting up a family office on the side as you were suggesting that limited partners and you know the funding maturity in India is going to be much more for PE funding so thank you very much uh, for sharing the panel with us today and uh, we thank look forward having to having more investments being driven out there <laughs> Thank you.